Good morning. Uh, welcome to our special meeting for October 15, 2015 for the uh, Calaveras County Board of Supervisors. And, um, and this is, uh, this is. So, so we uh, stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start off with public comment. Would anybody from the public like to make any comments that's uh, not on the agenda? So, any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board and is not posted on the consent or regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda before, uh, unless it is determined that. Uh, to be an emergency by the Board of Supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30 minute allotted time period, the board may immediately move to the consent agenda. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued at the conclusion of the regular agenda in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of the comments to be heard. So, any public comments? Good morning, Marty Crane, um, Valley Springs. Um, I went to a meeting at uh, at the um, community center in uh, Mountain Ranch last night. It was about insurance, know your rights. It was put on by a nonprofit. And I tried to bring back a set of guidebooks and information for each one of you, but they ran out. But I brought one for Chris. She dug in her bag, and that was the last one she had. Thanks. And the card is here, so you can always call. And the, the thought is that whether, for me, if, if, you're, if you can go home and your home was not impacted by this disaster, then you are now part of the, re the recovery effort. And so we should be thinking of how we can do that and step, it up, step up the game because it's gonna, it's gonna be a long time for this recovery. And we are not finished with our fire season. I think we all know that, but I think we need to know it in our hearts that we still have more that could burn, knock on wood. And, um, uh, so we have to make sure that we each have a go bag. We've been preaching that for 13 years now. By the time the sun sets tonight, every single person should have a, a bag ready to walk out the door uh, with things that would keep them comfortable and safe uh, for a period of five to seven days. Anyway, but if we should, I was thinking on the way over here, if we should have another disastrous event, we need the entire community to help uh, recover in that one too. So we need to hurry up and get our current area, the majority of District 2, back on its feet. So please check to see, um, check with Chris, check with the Mountain Ranch um, uh, Resource Center and Mary Sawicki at Calaveras Health and Human Services how you can help. And um, uh, Chris, you can call this number and get as many as you want. Great, thank you, Martin. Cliff and I were busy uh, working with uh, our on or something AT and T at that time, so um, that's why we weren't there. We had Somebody said it was the first time they went Mountain Ranch. They never had AT and T signal. That's that's because AT and T what they did. Very cool. Very cool. Just a quick question, guys. Is there going to be time for public comment after the presentation? Yes. Today? Okay. So I want to know. Thank you. Okay, any other public comments? All right, seeing none, we'll turn it over to the county council. Um, today we have Paul Smith with, from RCRC who has graciously um, been willing to come to the county. He has been going to multiple jurisdictions to give uh, an update on the uh, bills that have been pending. Um, the board may well, well be aware that uh, Senate Bill 643, uh, Assembly Bill 243 and 266 were in fact signed by the governor this last Friday on the 10th. 
Um, I'm sure Paul will be going into that um, here shortly, but I would like to just turn, turn it over to Paul with RCRC. Uh, may I make one quick comment? Yes. For the benefit of folks inside the audience and on television, RCRC stands for? Rural County Representatives of California. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and spending some time with you this morning about uh, medical marijuana uh, and, as Megan mentioned, the legislative package. If I could have one request, uh, technically, if we could blow up the actual slide, that would be really helpful as we go through that. Um, I don't know how to do that. I'm sure I can go through it. I just can't necessarily blow it up and we can get rid of all of those other things. That would be really helpful. I'm always hesitant to take over somebody's computer. There we go. Yeah, we're, we're really good. We're good. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, uh, to Supervisor Oliveira's point, yes, RCRC, Rural County Representatives of California. We are a 34-member association based in Sacramento. Obviously, Calaveras is a member. Supervisor Edson sits on our board of directors. Um, uh, we obviously represent the rural interests of the state. We are rural counties. All 34 are either in low population or remote uh, areas of the state. Uh, I will say this is a presentation that was developed both by RCRC and CSAC, our sister organization. Uh, CSAC is California State Association of Counties. They represent all 58. Um, but together we worked on this very extensively and you can see my name uh, uh, along with my uh, lobbyist colleague Karen Keene from CSAC. We were the two lobbyists uh, who had dealt with this issue for many years but more specifically worked on this uh, legislative package. I also, even though it's a, folks aren't in the room, I always say this to start things out because I think it's really important that um, Paul Smith and Karen Keene did not do this alone in terms of either building this presentation or dealing with the provisions I'm going to walk you through and the policies that are, uh, are coming before you as a board. Uh, we had the help of a lot of other people in county lands, and I always like to give a shout out to those people, whether they're listening or they're miles away. And first of all, our partnership with the Urban Counties Caucus, Jolena Verhuris, she is their lobbyist. Uh, they're an association of the 10 or 11 uh, large counties. Uh, some key supervisors uh, were very, very prominent in this conversation. Supervisor Doug Teeter of Butte, Supervisor Bob Williams of Tehama, and Supervisor Judy Morris of Trinity. All three of those uh, county supervisors were very engaged. Uh, either Karen and I were on the phone with them at least once or twice a week. Other folks uh, that need a shout out for the record also is uh, the brilliant county council in Tehama, Arthur Wileen. Uh, I understand Megan is following in her, his footsteps and will be uh, right there with him very shortly um, if he uh, ever, you know, uh, goes somewhere else in terms of uh, the bench or something like that. But we could not have done that work without Arthur and with the involvement uh, of Megan on, on many occasions. County Council in San Bernardino County, Christina Robb, and then finally a CAO who was very prominent in this conversation, Carmel Angelo of Mendocino. Um, also, this conversation was not done in a vacuum with just county supervisor organizations. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, we work very closely with Ag Commissioners Association, environmental health directors, uh, and uh, county health executives. So again, this was not just CAOs, county councils, and supervisors. We also looked at the county affiliates for guidance, and as we go through this presentation, you'll understand why. Let me also start by saying something extremely important. I think, I think members of the public need to really be aware of this as well as uh, members of the board. Our organizations do not have a policy position on whether marijuana is good, bad, should be legal, should be re remained illegal under state and or federal law. That was not the goal. That was not the conversation of this package and our pursuit of this package. Um, we believe that is left up to other entities, whether it's the voters as a whole, the courts, federal government, et cetera. What we were attempting to do, as you'll see in just a moment, we talk about policy principles, is if we're going to have marijuana, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we are, how are we as counties going to do with it from a variety of formats, whether it's land use, environmental health, food safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I want to make that very, very clear. I'm not here to present to you that marijuana is a good thing and let's all run off and, and do what we need to do relative. This is all about the conversation for you as a county as to how to navigate through this, uh, this regulatory and to a certain degree legislative package. Um, first of all, RCRC adopted policy principles. Um, I, I tell people two or three years ago, Karen Keene and I were walking the halls of the Capitol on the last few nights of session when we expected a medical marijuana bill uh, to potentially be voted on and be sent to the governor. Uh, that specific bill two years ago did not happen. But when we took a look at that bill, I posed the question to some key folks and I said, why are we opposing this? It's not that bad from my layman lobbyist's role. And what immediately came to mind is we need RCRC, the members, the supervisors that sit on that board, need to have some guidance for staff and or rural counties as a whole to navigate what we need and what you need to do your day-to-day -day work as it relates to this issue. Therefore, RCRC adopted policy principles in early uh, 2014. Um, they have been since modified, but for the most part, uh, we undertook that effort. That was a very collaborative process with a lot of supervisors and, again, county staff, some of I've already mentioned. Um, we weren't the only ones uh, CSAC did, although I will say that RCRCs, uh, you can't necessarily read all of that, but you can see that is quite extensive. CSACs was probably three quarters of a page and it was very limited. As you can see, there it is. Here are the four basic main ingredients of our policy principles. Preserving local control, explicit county taxing authority, ending the collective model, and addressing the environmental impacts. Those are the four principles that RCRC, CSAC, and others had to have in any regulatory package. That was a must have. Um, or else we would either oppose the bill or uh, we would, you know, be seeking, constantly seeking amendments to achieve those four goals. Ultimately, uh, as Megan said, a legislative package was sent to the governor on the last uh, night of session. It's a three bill package, SB 643, 24, AB 243, and AB 266. Uh, the governor did sign it, as Megan um, uh, alluded to again. And I will tell you that this package came together officially 10 hours before the adjournment of session. Session adjourned on September 11th. We saw this package for the first time, so to speak, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, now, I say that somewhat facetiously because 85% of this package, the provisions had already been written. They'd been in some other bill or some where before this thing was finally cobbled together. But there's about 15% that were brand new or kind of took us by surprise. And some of those uh, were good and were bad. Uh, I mentioned two years ago we had a package that died. We've had a legislative package or legislative bills for the last three or four years, about 10 or so bills that have died. This is the first package since SB 420 in the mid-2000s to actually pass the legislature and get signed into law. Um, I will also say this is an interlocking package. Um, you cannot read any one single bill alone. You have to look at it as, as its entirety. It is also hard to read. Um, I don't know if Megan's had a chance to jump through it, but you know, provisions one, two, three run in one bill, three, five, six run in another bill, four, seven, nine are back in that other bill, 10, 12, blah, blah, blah. They all interlock. At some point when we clean up uh, the codes and these get uh, put into your West codes, your other documents, it will flow. But I would caution you, if you're going to start looking at this package, you have to have all three bills in front of you, else it will not make sense. So, the key aspects of the package. The first is local control. There are four key clauses that I believe you all should be very, very aware of. These preserve your local land use authority. This preserves your ability to ban, this ability to ban cultivation, ban dispensaries, ban manufacturing facilities, to regulate them uh, in, in some form of land use manner. There are four key of them. This is the first one, 9135A. 
I will also say you all should have a chart that, uh, in addition to the PowerPoint presentation, and that is a good reference where a lot of these are located for you, um, and you can easily refer them to you. But as you will see, each one, there's a common theme in them, and that preserves your local land use authority. There's the second. There's the third. And there's the fourth. Why so many? Well, quite frankly, four is too small. Throughout this package, we had references to local land use uh, authority preservation in probably a dozen, maybe 15 aspects. Why? Because this is a very litigious area of, of policy. I wouldn't necessarily say law just yet, although that's coming. But this is a very litigious area of public policy, and we needed to build in as many redundancies as possible so that your, um, your actions and the legal consequence of those actions that litigation would be minimized. And so that's why you have, again, three different areas of the code that speak to your ability to regulate in local land use, local zoning uh, aspects. Very, very important. The, uh, the second major key aspect in our second priority was the issue of t county taxing authority, and we call this explicit and broad county taxing authority. You will see, obviously, the reference codes we have it. There are, the first one, 19348, is by far the, the, the most important one for you, uh, but 19340C is also very explicit as it relates to deliveries, and then, of course, 19320D is more uh, referenced for your fee uh, setting authority that you will have assuming you will engage um, this, this board or this county at some point will engage in its regulatory uh, manner. But why is this important? Um, this is, like I said, our second priority. Um, what this does is it gives you explicitly the authority to levy a tax at the county level. Um, you probably have that authority now. The issue is we want to make a nine-year lawsuit a two-year lawsuit because if you were to enact a cultivation tax, uh, you will likely be sued by some disgruntled somebody. Um, and so to minimize that legal exposure, we needed 19348. Every county is going to tax cultivation in a different manner. Some may do it on a per plant basis. Some may do it on a flower basis et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So each one, we believe, will be challenged. That's the history of marijuana and medical marijuana in this state for 20 years. So we wanted to make sure, again, to avoid every single challenge, every option that you have, you minimize your legal exposure. And again, let me, let me kick it home even more, why it's even more important. Um, we did not want you to take the tough act of levying a cultivation tax, get sued, have to defend that lawsuit with the proceeds of the tax, thereby the proceeds of the tax not going to where you wanted them to go in the first place. I think Calaveras is small enough, but counties like Trinity with only 14,000 people, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres under cultivation, they would be wiped out if they tried to enact a cultivation tax for enforcement due to their litigation costs. This preserves, uh, preserves that option for them. I will tell you, on the, on the broad taxing authority, 19348, the process for you to enact a tax remains the same. Nothing has changed. You still need a vote of this body. You still need to go to your voters uh, if you are seeking a tax. Again, if a general tax, majority vote, if you specifically dedicate it, it's a two-thirds vote. We do not change the process of the tax. All we are is explicitly saying you have that authority. Why is it say county taxing authority and not city and county taxing authority? Um, because cities have their constitutional rights vested in different areas of the code and the constitution. They believe they didn't need this explicit. So if Angels Camp wants to levy some type of tax uh, above and beyond, they will not be relying on 19348. They will be relying on a different set of codes and statutes. Ending the collective model was our third priority of counties. And what that means really is 
commencing a strict licensing scheme. And that's what 19320A does. It creates a strict licensing scheme for commercial cannabis activity. I will be frank and tell you that the term commercial was something that we did not like inserted in this clause. We thought that any cannabis activity, not just commercial cannabis activity, should be subject to licensure. That was a point where we were not as successful as we'd like to be in terms of uh, convincing policymakers. But nevertheless, the, the statute is if you are engaged in commercial cannabis activity, you need to have a license. So you can no longer rely on uh, what has been the previous uh, scheme for legally allowing cultivation, possession, and use of marijuana. Uh, we will now be moving to a licensing scheme. The licensing scheme does not for use. This is strictly for dispensing, cultivation, manufacturing, transporting, testing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, obviously, a big issue for Calaveras and all of the RCRC member counties is environmental enforcement. This is where we really knew that to address this issue, this was kind of the eye on the prize. Because of so much environmental degradation, particularly on the North Coast, but I think throughout all of, of uh, rural California, we have to deal with the environmental impacts of marijuana, period. Marijuana cultivation, primarily. And so the environmental enforcement um, provisions are good. They are not great, but they are good. Um, the biggest issue here is how much revenue will come into various uh, cookie jars, both at the state or local level, to, to make an impact. And I'll come back to that when we talk about uh, a cultivation tax uh, later in the presentation. But nevertheless, the structure exists to, to finally get some state monies and some state enforcement activities above and beyond what's occurring now. And so we insisted that uh, this aspect of the package uh, be included. And quite frankly, this was a relatively uh, easy lift. Policymakers uh, and legislators recognized that something needed to be done. License exemptions. So there are um, two categories of entities that are exempt from the licensing scheme. One is for personal grows, and one is for patient caregivers. Uh, they also receive an exemption. So if you are going to grow only for your use, um, you do not need to get a license. Um, there is no, there is no uh, set definition of what a personal grow is. It's not, there's no per plant count. There's no square footage count. It, there is just simply a personal grows exemption. On the patient caregiver side, there is a limitation. You will see uh, uh, what looks to be a doctor surrounded by five people. And that is purposeful because the patient caregiver exemption is for only five patients. You cannot grow for more than five patients and be exempt from licensure. But you should know there are two categories of licensure exemptions spelled out in the code. The big question is, does local control apply to those exempt? And the answer is yes. Under Health and Safety Code 11362.77G, those who are exempt still must fall under a local jurisdiction's rules. This was very, very fought over in the legislature. Quite frankly, we were surprised that this part of the package was retained. We had much stronger language in various aspects of all bills that made it even more clear than that, that you continue to have local uh, authority on those that are exempt. So. Just be, if this county were to ban, per se, um, uh, and that would be the policy of this county, regardless of the licensing scheme, you could not do a personal grow in this county legally. Okay? So that's a very, very, I, I would make sure you become very aware of that. A lot of people do not realize that that is in there because it is, quite frankly, buried in AB 243, but it does exist. Some key must knows uh, in the package. Dual licensing. Uh, the, the package requires that in order to get a state license, you also have to have a local license to operate. So if you want to open up a dispensary, uh, you have to get approval in two jurisdictions, the state as well as the local. And I'll come to that in just a second because there's, there's an issue on what constitutes a local license. 
This is very important for rural counties, and that is local goes first as it relates to cultivation. So a cultivation application for licensure must commence and be obtained at the local level before going to the state. What con constitutes a local license is not clear in the statutes. You do not necessarily have to have an ordinance. You do not necessarily have to have a permit. But you have to have some sanctioning entity to allow for a proceeding of an applicant beyond the local level to uh, obtain a license at the state. This is kind of one of my uh, counsels then uh, for boards and what we are telling counties. And that is you need to start thinking about what that's going to look like. And I assume all 58 counties are going to do it slightly differently. Some will adopt ordinances. Some will purposely not have ordinances. Some will have licensing schemes. Some will not have licensing schemes. Some will just let their land use permitting authority go forth. Whatever it is, you need to start thinking about how you want to do that. Because when this licensing scheme comes into full effect, assuming January 1, 2018, you're going to have people show up, say, I want, an, I want a cultivation license. Give me whatever document I need so I can take it to the state and, and move on. And so that's one of the things I would start really contemplating here as to what your obligation is. Um, the statutes are not clear as it relates to dispensaries, manufacturers, transporters. It does not necessarily that commencement has to start at the state level. It doesn't really speak to that. What is very clear is locals have to start at the cultivation level. So, I would argue that you have the ability to go first on a transport license or a dispensary license, et cetera. Um, that may be tested. That may, may, may be something you want to do. Maybe you don't want to do, it, again, depending on that. But, that's, but the codes are not necessarily clear about who goes first other than in cultivation. This is a mobile deliveries is another aspect uh, that I, I think uh, you need to be aware of. And that is the default on mobile deliveries is that they are allowed. And furthermore, they can only be prohibited in your jurisdiction by the enactment of a local ordinance. And the statute 19340 is very, very clear. You have to have an ordinance. Have to have an ordinance if you are going to prohibit mobile deliveries in your jurisdiction. Um, let me say a couple things about this as well. Uh, Probably not the biggest problem in Calaveras because you only have one incorporated city. But if you have more than one, the question will be if, let's, let's assume San Andreas was incorporated. Angel's Camp uh, did not have a prohibition ordinance and San Andreas did not have a prohibition on um, mobile deliveries. Could a mobile delivery occur originating out of Angel's Camp, go through the unincorporated area, and have a delivery made in San Andreas? The answer is yes. You cannot prevent that from occurring as long as San Andreas and Angel's Camp agree on mobile deliveries. We fought very hard over that, and unfortunately we lost. Our position was no, that San and uh, Angel's Camp can only make mobile deliveries in Angel's Camp. They can't make mobile deliveries regardless of what an ordinance may say in the unincorporated or in, let's say, San Andreas. Why? Because we were very mindful that your sheriffs or your CHP may not necessarily know what the rules are in each jurisdiction's relative to mobile deliveries. We didn't want a lot of marijuana moving through the unincorporated area where, again, your jurisdiction's uh, uh, law enforcement may not know. Not the hugest problem in Calaveras because you only have one, but in counties where you have a lot of cities, um, this can get confusing. But the last thing, again, I want to drive home this. You will need to act to prohibit them, and you will need to enact an ordinance. Um, the question here is on timing. A lot of people ask, well, when do we have to uh, address this? My advice is to do it sooner rather than later. Um, does that mean prior to January 1? Not necessarily, but I would encourage you to think about, it, uh, about acting before January 1, if that is the will of this board to prohibit uh, local ordinances. Um, Lawyers will disagree on those statutes uh, on, in terms of a date operative, uh, but nevertheless, my advice is act sooner rather than later if you want to prohibit mobile deliveries in this county. 
Cities have the option to enforce state standards. Again, not a big issue for you because you only have one city, and I would venture to guess that the City of Angels Camp is probably not interested in this. But you need to be aware of it in, in, in case it does occur. Um, cities have the option to petition the state to take over all enforcement efforts of the statutes. I know. Why would any city want to do that? blows our mind that the League of Cities fought very, very hard for this provision. Um, there are some larger cities like Oakland, like Los Angeles, uh, where I can envision this. But nevertheless, we made sure that if a city assumes enforcement role, and again, uh, at the discretion of the state, that you have no liability. You have no liability with your environmental health department, your public health department, whatever it may be. Um, even if you have contracts already with uh, cities to do all of those things, those city contracts do not necessarily pick up marijuana activities as a default. Do counties have this explicit authority? They do not in this statute, although I would say clever lawyers could probably figure out a way for counties to assume some further enforcement role. I will tell you, of all of the 58, I've not heard of one that's interested in doing this. Local role in enforcement. Uh, the statute is very clear that you have a role in examining the financial records of uh, licensed operators in your jurisdiction. And it's very clear that you have the ability to coordinate amongst all law enforcement agencies, and quite frankly, all enforcement agencies, not just law enforcement. There is an expectation, I would, I would say this, there is not only uh, is it spelled out, but there is an expectation for local involvement in the enforcement of the licensing structure. Background checks, licensing restrictions, all applicants for a license must go through the Department of Justice. Uh, and there are a variety of criminal violations that would trigger failure to obtain. I don't believe I have the slide here that, yes, I don't, that lists them. Some of these presentations I go into, but in sake of brevity, uh, uh, I have not listed them. The issue comes up in terms of, okay, um, Paul, I'm supposed to be the entity that goes first on a cultivation license. Should I have some background check at the local level before they walk to the state and go through the State Department? Um, to put it more bluntly is, can a county set up their own um, background checks process and expand above and beyond what the state restrictions are? The answer is probably so, but be prepared for a lawsuit. The statute is not clear as to whether you can uh, definitely do it, but it's not clear that you can't. And so we would encourage you uh, to study that closely if you want to develop further um, restrictions uh, as it relates to the background checks. Other relevant aspects of the, um, the, uh, the legislative package. The first one is very important, employer restrictions. Um, So again, I apologize. Some of these presentations, depending on, our, on, our, on the group we're speaking to, we get in more detail. Um, and in some of those slides, I show you exactly where, uh, what the language of the employer restrictions language looks like. I do not in this presentation. But again, it's referenced in this chart. Um, the employer restrictions. We made sure that you have a section of the, of the package which continues to allow you to set policies for marijuana use for your employees. So just because we're moving to a legal uh, regulatory structure for medical marijuana does not uh, mean that anyone, any one of your employees can just show up as a user um, and claim whatever uh, status they have, whether they're a licensee or a personal grow, whatever. You still have the ability to say, you know, have a zero tolerance threshold or, or what have you. Um, the reason why this was so important is because you get a lot of federal money coming through this county and uh, there's a there's a federal statute called the Drug Free Workplace Act. We wanted to make sure that we had maximum ability to comply with the Federal Drug Free Workplace Act, which of course um, is, is contingent upon, uh, uh, abidance of that act is contingent upon monies you come, coming into your county. Transportation standards. This was an area that uh, uh, I talked about the 15% that was totally new and, and came as a surprise to us on the last night of session. Very, very little transportation standards uh, put in the statute, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis what was in the package earlier on in the legislative process. 
The bottom line is, is the transportation standards will be developed by the state, by the Bureau of Medical Marijuana, the, the key licensing uh, entity. Um, the only requirement uh, that exists in the statute is a manifest and your ability to inspect that manifest at any time. Other than that, whether or not you have to have staff with two people, whether you can only deliver between eight and eight, uh, whether you can only take this road as opposed to that road, all of that is punted to the regulatory level. The same as STAM stands for pesticide standards. Um, uh, most of that is going to be developed through CDFA and the Department of Pesticide Review. Um, I assume your agricultural commissioners uh, will be very involved in that. Um, there are provisions in the, the code which try to minimize the impact of the federal prohibition on pesticide use applications. Another way, in other words, we're trying to figure out a way around federal law to make it work for environmental purposes as it relates to pesticide use and standards. Again, that's a conversation kicked to the regulatory level. Cross ownership restrictions. There are a variety of uh, restrictions on the amount of licenses one can hold. Uh, in other words, you cannot be a grower, a distributor, a manufacturer, and a retailer all at the same time. Uh, we put in a variety of restrictions um, so that we do not have vertical integration. And this was a very, very controversial piece. It was, again, one of the last things to get worked out. Quite frankly, it is still an evolving thing. I'll be happy to talk more in detail about this, but this gets very, very um, uh, detailed. All I will tell you is that you, the, the statute is very clear that you cannot have a multitude of licenses. With every restrictions, there are some exemptions, and again, I can uh, get into that if, if there are questions about that. Finally, uh, two other aspects, mandatory distribution. All the <laughs> marijuana will be moving through a, a, a distribution tier. This is very similar to alcoholic beverage law. It was done there on purpose for two reasons. One, to talk about cross ownership issues, but more importantly for tax issues. It is so much easier to collect a tax from a handful of distributors than it is from thousands of cultivators. And then finally, the most important thing I think for you today is the issue of C4 and AB 243 um, and the removal of it. This is an, an area of of uh, the package that was, um, how should I say, not, uh, not thorough. Um, what C4 requires is basically that the state will take over certain regulatory and licensing functions of cultivators unless you have an ordinance enacted prior to March 1, 2016. Um, the author of AB 243, Assemblyman Jim Wood from the North Coast, uh, has made it very clear that he intends to remove the C4 section in AB 243 with what we call an urgency uh, bill <coughs> in January, meaning he would like to see uh, a bill run through the entire legislative process in about mm, 80 days uh, that will remove C4 uh, out of the codes and so it won't impact you. So for counties that do not have a cultivation ordinance now, this is something you need to be aware of. Um, I believe Mr. Wood, uh, at his word, that he will, he will attempt to do that, and I believe there's great sentiments to, to removing C4 out of the package. But we are talking about the legislature. And uh, I cannot guarantee you that it will come out, uh, and, or I can guarantee you that it will completely come out as it is now. In other words, maybe it gets uh, toyed with. Um, my advice there is obviously um, stay in contact with RCRC, CSAC, or those that are watching this. Um, if you feel compelled, maybe you do want to act before the March deadline to get something uh, on the books. Um, it does not necessarily, there are, it, it, your ordinance doesn't, doesn't have to meet certain tests. Um, it's relatively vague in terms of what constitutes a local cultivation ordinance, but again, you have to be aware of this, uh, this section, and I, I can assure you other county councils, in addition to Megan, uh, have, have contacted us about this uh, and are very, very nervous. Uh, you will not, um, you are, will not be alone in that um, fashion. Um, regulatory efforts. Um, there are a variety of regulatory efforts uh, uh, underway. Uh, the most that I, uh, the most um, visible right now are actions by 
uh, regional water quality control boards. For your purpose, the Central Valley is probably the uh, most important one. Um, these are independent of the legislative package. Uh, we threw them in our slideshow just so you are, be aware of them, particularly in this area where you are impacted by the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. These are uh, regulatory orders. Um, the Central Valley is uh, in process uh, of, of adopting these. Uh, testimony was heard uh, two weeks ago, or two weeks from tomorrow, in Reading on their package. Uh, their package is modeled after the North Coast waiver, which was adopted uh, a couple months ago. These are the key elements of it. Um, the, 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 obviously, the one at the top is, 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 you know, from a county perspective, is heaven sent because you will not be able to get a, a waste discharge uh, waiver um, if you are acting out of uh, compliance with the county ordinance. Again, an issue for you because you don't necessarily have one. But again, it, it speaks again to the respect that I think the state has for deferring to um, uh, local jurisdictions. I think everything kind of speaks for itself there. Um, we support this package. Uh, Supervisor Bob Williams, who I mentioned earlier, uh, testified in Reading to the board uh, in support of the package. We supported the North Coast. We think these are a, a good way to attack, uh, particularly the environmental and water quality issues for marijuana cultivation at the regulatory level. Um, so I mentioned uh, the word cultivation tax a few moments ago. There are two bills you need to be aware of that are not part of this package. They were introduced on the last night of session as the legislature was uh, winding down. They are AB 1548 and AB 1549. I think you are going to be most concerned with AB 1548, which is a cultivation tax proposal. I will say this is a state cultivation tax. This does not interfere with a local uh, county taxing option. This would be in addition uh, and above and beyond. It's a different uh, scheme altogether. There are the details right now of what the tax uh, would look like as proposed. Again, collected at the distributor level uh, and the Board of Equalization would administer and contact, uh, collect the tax quarterly. This is a two-thirds vote bill. It's a tax increase, so you will have to have Republicans going up on a tax increase, which is going to be difficult. The cultivation tax was part of the earlier versions of the package. On the last night of session, it fell out, um, primarily because of the two-thirds issue. Uh, there was not uh, enough Republicans <coughs> to go up on this tax. There probably wasn't even enough Democrats. But this bill will be heard in January. I do expect it to move. Um, I expect that the RCRC Board of Directors will uh, consider this at the December board meeting for action where, we, where staff will be requesting a supportive amended position on it. Uh, and that is the only amendments that we'll be seeking are to clarify the role between the state and the locals as it relates to tax and the proceeds of the tax. The tax is specifically uh, designed to deal with environmental mitigation. I mentioned that the existing package has some monies coming into it uh, through the fines and penalties account. We believe that while um, we're very appreciative of that, we don't think it's enough. And we probably need a cultivation tax uh, to generate a significant amount of revenue to do the things that need to be done uh, on the environmental side, which of course you will see uh, as Assemblyman Wood is proposing a variety of destinations for that money. They all have a common theme, which is addressing the environmental aspects of cultivation. The second bill that Mr. Wood introduced on the last night of session is, uh, is uh, basically what we call the state banking. Um, for lack of a better term, it's, this is a spot bill, meaning it's, it's not completely flushed out. Uh, a lot of language needs to be added to it. But the goal is to create a state financial institution for the medical marijuana industry so it can have basic banking services. Federal law prohibits um, uh, banking in this arena. I, I say that generally speaking. Um, this is an attempt to try to work around uh, federal law. Uh, Colorado is going through a similar exercise now. Um, we believe this is very important to counties because you just don't want people walking into your treasure tax collector paying their property tax in cash. It's an all cash business right now. We don't think that's good for you uh, to be handling that kind of cash. Uh, we think it's hard for you to inspect and examine the records of your operators uh, that are licensed. 
um, because it's, again, all cash business. So again, the RCRC Board of Directors will be considering this for action. We expect the board will um, adopt a support position. Finally, you can't really talk about this medical marijuana package without talking about the looming uh, discussion of a ballot measure to legalize recreational use uh, in addition to medical use. Um, what I can say is that um, all of the organizations um, impacting counties, CSAC, RCRC, UCC, we are in dialogue with ballot measure writers. Um, particularly one that is likely to be filed in the next few weeks that will, I think, be a funded campaign and a viable campaign. It will have the money uh, to collect signatures. We'll have the money to run a, a viable campaign. A lot of those themes that I talked to you about in terms of environmental protections, uh, strict licensure, um, local land use, we will be insisting that those be in the ballot measure. Uh, I am relatively optimistic that the ballot measure writers will uh, build those protections in. They may not be as good or as thorough as what we see on the medical side, but I believe that there will be um, those protections uh, in there. Um, but I will say at this point, we just don't know what, uh, what will be unveiled. Uh, timeline um, on ballot measures, probably need to get something into the Secretary of State and the Attorney General by December. Price goes up a lot after that, not impossible. Drop dead dates, late February, early March. If it's not done by then, uh, it probably is not going to make uh, the November ballot measure. Uh, but again, we are very mindful that ballot measures exist. Um, much of this regulatory package that was put in these three bills was predicated on seeing a ballot measure and having the voters approve something on recreational use. With that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the formal presentation available for questions as, as I can best answer them and uh, response on, on members of the public if that's uh, your so desire. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions from the board? Sure. <clears throat> um, so just, I just wanted to clarify on the personal grow exemption, um, there's no state requirement for that. Um, if the county adopts something, then that's what it is, and that's correct. And, correct. It, and do they, uh, personal grow, um, I mean, uh, if we, but they're required to have a permit from the, from the local or, uh, um, county or city? The personal grow would not be required to have a permit as a condition of the state. Okay. In other words, the state is not forcing uh, a personal grow to get a local sanction. Okay. Your local sanction determines whether you get local sanction. Does that make sense? Yes, thank, thank you for yeah. just wanting to make sure. Yeah. There's uh, no state involvement, it's completely correct. punted. Okay, and then, um, so, but it seems like you were saying that we could, uh, local entities uh, could ban um, that outright. You could. You still pre the, the package continues to preserve your ability to ban uh, cultivation, dispensing, whatever it may be for personal use, for personal use, for or for patient caregivers. Correct. Those exempt. Those that are exempt are not exempt from local rules. So, I will tell you politically, that's a very tough issue. Right. And I would not be surprised if a ballot measure. I don't want to say undoes that, but right. I wouldn't be surprised if a ballot measure speaks to that because well, that was very controversial. Yeah, I guess that's the question I had. So you had Prop 215, right, that established that it was legal to use medical marijuana. So how can the – so this overrides that, that proposition is what you're saying? Remember, Prop 215 is a criminal defense on possession and use for medical purposes. It does not give anybody a right to – be licensed or use. It's a criminal defense. Okay. So the courts have been very clear that your local land use authority is retained, uh, cultivation, dispensary, et cetera, in a variety of court cases. So we could pass a law that says you can't do it, but not necessarily, but it could be challenged by an individual using marijuana to say Prop 2. And that is going on hourly throughout the state. Okay. And so I, I, I think you will prevail. Um, you're seeing that going on in Yuba County right now where they went from a, a relatively liberal ordinance to a very strict ordinance and now they are being subject to suit. 
I'll also tell you that there have been three RCRC member counties where the, where the ordinances have been referendumed because they were too restrictive as well, Butte, Lake, and Nevada. So you not only run the risk of litigation, if you go hardline, you run issue of, of referendum. And that's a very real thing that I would caution folks to be mindful of. Okay, can I, can I continue with my questions or you want me to? Yeah, you good? Go ahead. Uh, so, um, on the patient caregiver exemption, um, I just wanted a little more clarification on that. Uh, no more than five patients, what, what does that mean? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, you can look at the strict reading of the statute, and I'm going to try to look it up really quick here, um, 19319. Um, can you, for lack of a better term, can you play a game with the numbers? Uh, and the answer is probably yes. So that five threshold could be pretty interesting as it relates to the patient caregiver. So in other words, can Paul Smith have a grow for Megan, Shirley, Ryan, Cliff, and Chris and enjoy the state exemption, but at the same time have a grow for Steve, Michael, Debbie, and Karen at the same time? And the answer is probably yes. Um, okay. So that you, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how that plays itself out. Or a what's, mark next to that. What's, more, what's more apt to happen is my brother, who lives with me in the same property, he becomes the patient caregiver for those five, I become the patient caregiver for those five, and off we go. Uh, and we're exempt from licensure. There's going to be a lot of different ways to play with that. Um, and again, I'll come back to if you're going to do something at the local level, um, tiptoe, tiptoe carefully in this. And then I guess the, the final one um, for right now is, is the, you know, like you addressed the ballot measures. Um, and so, uh, you know, it seems like if you were to make it legal for just recreational use, then these become I mean, I guess it really still depends on what the actual ballot measure will do uh, before we can really know how those are going to. You're absolutely right. So reading um, the tea leaves then we, at this point. Right. With what we'd be doing, Supervisor, is we would be reading tea leaves. I can give you a tons of Paul Smith beliefs of how the world will be three or four years from now. Um, some of them will pan out that way. Others won't. I can just say that couple things. Um, the governor came into this, uh, to this regulatory package in the last two months with fervor. So this package, he, not only did he sign them, but he helped craft them. His agencies helped craft them. Politically, I see a connection there with the ballot measure. I don't see viable proponents of a ballot measure undoing a lot of what the governor put forth. I don't okay. think proponents of a ballot measure want to be working against Governor Brown as they try to get a majority of the voters to do this. So what I mean, what I ultimately mean by that is I think you're going to see a parallel system that, not completely, but I think you're going to see a parallel system that, that works together. Well, that makes me feel better. Yeah, That's, I mean, I hate to go through all the trouble yeah. of crafting an ordinance based on this stuff and then, oh, no, sorry, it's all changed. You can get started. Right. So. Right. And then uh, finally, um, uh, are, are there? Are you guys developing uh, draft uh, model ordinances for us? We are not. Uh, we do host uh, other jurisdictions' model, uh, other jurisdictions' ordinances on a website, and encourage Megan to work with a variety of folks. They're out there. Everyone does it slightly different, okay. and you have to tailor it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else over here? The the cross ownership restrictions. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm not completely clear on that. Are we saying if somebody goes and gets a license, and we have our license ordinance straightened out here also, then say th their license for that particular business entity or whatever, okay, and then somebody comes up and says, oh, you're doing a really good job. Can you partner with me on mine? We're saying they can't go on to another license? So... Um Ultimately, that's the intent, um, Supervisor. Uh, when, when you get actually into the words and the, 
the, the readings of the statute. It's a little bit more liberal than that. Um, what we say is you can't hold two licenses. You can't hold more than two in a category, meaning you can't be a, uh, you can't be a, a grower, a manufacturer, and a retailer. I'll keep it to the, those three because that's the simplest way to do it. You can't be all three. You can probably be two under most circumstances. Uh, and the exceptions are if you're a tester or, or a transporter. Um, that's the goal there, is to prevent an entity from having all three. There are exceptions to that, and I'm happy to walk you through on the two big ones that exist. Um, but that's the overall goal, is to make sure um, you don't have consolidated entities. With all due respect, I'll say it here out loud, we don't want the Walmartization of marijuana in California. That's, that's basically the rhetoric that was used during the discussions of the package. You don't want a big entity owning all aspects of the operation. Um, politically, you don't want to do it, both at the state and local level, and for market penetration and protecting basically what a number of RCRC member counties are concerned about is large corporate entities coming in right off the bat and taking over the, uh, the industry, and that's why it was put in there. Okay, and along that same line, uh, let, let's say someone has a large parcel of land, which does exist up here, uh, one to 2,000 acres or something, and so their idea is to lease out different parcels to almost tenants that cultivate, uh, and they, are there any restrictions against there are. that? There are. There are uh, restrictions on a license per um, maximum square footage, and I believe it's 44,000 square feet to get a maximum license. So if you were to cultivate 88,000 square feet, you'd have to have two licenses in the cultivation category. You can, you can only get a license up to that. There are also licenses that are smaller based on um, square footage of canopy size, but 44,000 is basically about an acre. So um, if a, the other thing on that is that that landowner has to consent for that activity um, to occur on, on, on his property, his leased property. So basically, if you want to cultivate you know, 1,000 acres, you're going to have a multitude of licenses for all of those operators on there. That's not necessarily an issue of cross-ownership. It's basically trying to keep tabs on you know, the growing and, and the, the checklist for getting a license to grow. Because each time you're going to have to go back to the local to get the permit or the, the sanction and then go to the state. So we, we keep very close tabs on who's cultivating. Okay, and there, uh, there, I had a question too about the mobile transporting. Okay, um, if our ordinances says you can do this, etc., in this Calaveras County, and they cross into a county that does not allow it, they're under violation of the law and they can be arrested in that county. Am I correct? Yeah, whatever. Well, a couple things. If they are delivering in, so if, if you have, let's assuming Calaveras County allows mobile deliveries, and so does Angel's Camp. If, Angel, if a dispensary out of Angel's Camp wants to deliver in Jackson, and Jackson says yes to mobile deliveries, you cannot prevent that. You can't, you can't prevent that. So yes, you can cross out of the county. You just have to go to another jurisdiction that allows it. If... If the delivery is made in Amador and Amador says no, regardless of whether it originates out of Jackson or, in, or, or Angels, that's not allowed. So crossing the county boundary really is not at issue. It's whether the, 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 the exporting jurisdiction and the importing jurisdiction both allow. That's what you need. You need both of those entities to say yes. What if they haven't addressed it yet? That's an excellent question. Then the default is it can occur. Then they can make the mobile delivery. Correct. So it's if the up jurisdiction to, hasn't taken care of their business. That's correct. That's that's their correct. fault. That's correct. Yeah. So okay. let's just say let's assume Jackson, the city of Jackson, sits on its hands for the next five years, and San Andreas is, or excuse me, uh, Angels Camp is you know, a permissive mobile deliveries. Yes, you're going to see a lot of movement back and forth, because Amador County or the city of Jackson did not prohibit them. So a cultivator here is transporting cannabis to uh, 
uh, oh, three counties away, and they cross through two counties that don't allow it, they get stopped for a speeding violation. And, yeah, there's you know, two, two different dynamics there, Supervisor. One is a mobile delivery, which is different than a transport from a cultivator. Okay. Those are two different dynamics. Okay. Uh, for, a mo for a mobile delivery, that has to originate out of a licensed dispensary. Um, and we talked about that. For moving cannabis for processing, that's a completely different world, and I talked about the transportation standards will be developed later for that. that. The only thing I can say to that is, if you have a cultivator in Tuolumne County, and you have a processor or a dispenser in Jackson, you cannot interfere as a county with the movement of that cultivated marijuana through Calaveras oh, County. Okay. Okay. And that, that, that has nothing to do with your ordinance. We, that's very clear, you cannot prevent the movement of, of, of that product. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question, Mr. Smith? A couple of questions. On those same lines, that movement through a county that prohibits that transportation must be just documented by manifest? Okay, you cannot, let's be very clear again, you cannot prevent a product, a cannabis product coming through your jurisdiction, mm -hmm. okay? If a grow occurs in Tuolumne County and either a dispensary or a manufacturer is in Amador County, that, that commodity cannot be impeded by this board or by this county. The only time you can impede it is, is if a mobile delivery to a patient is occurring. And that's a different dynamic, meaning Again, the mobile delivery has to originate out of a licensed dispensary. And that you have the power to regulate. In that circumstance, that must be manifested. The, uh, it is unclear how to manifest a mobile delivery. Okay. That has not been prescribed out. As it relates to general transport, yes, there has to be a manifest associated with that. Uh, and your law enforcement will still have the ability to inspect that manifest. So if, again, coming out of Tuolumne, going to Amador, Calaveras County Sheriff pulls over that truck, you obviously have the ability to inspect that manifest. You just cannot prohibit it. In the area of code compliance, is code compliance authorized to inspect records by peace officers or by code compliance? We were very inspectors. careful to make sure that both, not just exclusively law enforcement. So uh, your, you, whoever is, is handling this in your jurisdiction, whether it's a code enforcement officer or whomever, it's not just reserved for uh, uh, law enforcement and sheriffs. Very, very clear about that. And there's no need for a warrant or any other type of it's on demand, like ABC, as far as alcohol-related uh, dispensing. In other words, you can walk into an establishment that has an ABC license, and just a peace officer requesting to see a license and do inspections without a warrant. That's correct. Um, I don't believe there are any restrictions on the time of inspections. There were in the previous bills. That's why I'm hesitant, and I'm answering your question slowly. Uh, there, were, there were restrictions on when an, uh, a, a, a regulator could inspect those books. I believe they were all removed and inspectors have carte blanche. I can get back to you on that for sure, but I, I'm almost positive that is, is the case. And, and yes, there is no warrant. This is now, a- when you mention this regulators, a, you mean state regulators? Local or, or local or state, regulators. local or state. All regulators. Correct, Thank you. correct. Uh, I, I can guarantee you, you do not need a warrant because, again, we're in a licensing dynamic. You would still need a warrant on illegal possession Absolutely. without a license. Or transportation that, without that, right. when you're going down, licenses. Right. When you're going down the criminal statutes, yes. But on a licensing, no, you do not need a warrant. And just to reiterate, there is no effect on the existing criminal laws on the books now. Other than licensing and then qualifying and registering. 
I'm hesitant to give you a carte blanche on to answer, and that's all. I'll answer it this way. Uh, the code, the package is very clear that if you operate outside of the license, you are still subject to the penal code. Thank you. And that was reinforced. And uh, the chiefs, uh, law enforcement wanted that in the code. That's all I have. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about the Bureau of Marijuana Regulation. Where, where is that falling in the state's arena of departments and such? It's located within the Department of Consumer Affairs. Mm -hmm. Very controversial. Um, it uh, was a compromise. There were a variety of entities that were flown up the flagpole during the whole two, three year process. Ultimately, it was arrived at the Department of Consumer Affairs um, as the main entity within the Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation. It is not the only sole state entity involved in the licensing process. I've mentioned CDFA, I've mentioned Department mm -hmm. of Pesticide Review, I believe the California Highway Patrol is referenced in there as well. Obviously, state background checks are through DOJ. So, but the main entity that's going to be coordinating all this and I believe uh, issuing the licenses, particularly on the dispensary side, is uh, within Department of Consumer Affairs. And that's not established yet, right? Correct. Okay. It is not. It does not exist uh, uh, And did today. I hear most of this takes effect January 1 of 2017? Um, the statute goes into effect technically January 1, 2016. Uh -huh. the, there's not a lot of dates in the bill. Okay. Um, the only one that I'm really familiar hard and fast is the January 1, 2018 date, and that's, it's really not even a hard and fast rule as to licensing, but we basically have until then to come up with these dates. I will say we still operate under a collective model scheme until those licensing um, statutes take effect as prescribed in the statute. So. Don't be under any illusion that on January 1, we have this whole new licensing scheme, here we go. Mm -hmm. We still have the incumbent structure uh, that we have to operate under until all of those licensing um, things take effect. Good news, bad news of that is you still have your land use uh, authority um, that you, know, you can utilize sooner than okay. later. Was there any funding structure to support establishing this Yes, uh, the uh, package has an advance of some general fund monies um, to launch this with the expectation that license fees that will come later will backfill those state general fund obligations. The idea is in future years this will be all fee supported. Yeah. Um, the cultivation tax conversation is a little bit outside of that um, because you would be enacting a tax which would fund specific environmental work. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's a fee structure. And again, I, back to that slide about local taxing authority, it's very clear that counties have fee authority on this as well. And we're very clear about that. Okay. And then the percentages you mentioned in here about, you know, percent goes to this area and percent goes to that area, that's all written into the bill. So that, it's not like it goes into the general fund. It's going to go specifically to. Remember, that's, that's an AB 18, uh, 1548, and that has not been enacted yet. Okay. That that's is. The, that Mr. Wood would have wanted it. It was part of the package. It okay. came out on the last night of session. It's a separate bill that will be moving afterwards. That is the bill that does prescribe tax proceeds for environmental enforcement. The incumbent scheme now is funded through fines and penalties mm -hmm. to do environmental enforcement. That is taking effect under the package. Okay. We have to work to secure a cultivation tax to get those additional monies. Okay. And when you mentioned about land use, so anywhere in these bills, does it address the local land use um, in regards to, you know, size of property, number of plants per person, indoor, outdoor, Not odor, noise? The only None thing it does is sets parameters on what license you need at the state level based okay. on your size. Okay. Um, so that's the only reference to that. So it's right. still within the local land use? Correct. Okay. You have the ability to do per plant, per Whatever canopy size, per square foot, put it in ag zoning, put it in industrial, all of those land use decisions you still retain. Okay. And on the patient caregiver one and the personal 
grow exemption, I would assume their card and all of that still plays a role in this. It does. Uh, I'll give you a sneak preview. One of the the ballot, one of the drafts of the ballot measures that we saw um, speaks to what Supervisor Wright brought up on the personal uh, grows, and that if if the ballot measure is retained in the way we saw it, yes, you would be required to have a card uh, to do a personal grow. In this package, that is not necessarily the case. You do not necessarily need a county issued medical marijuana ID card to enjoy a personal exemption. You, it would be strongly advised you get one, right. but as a matter of law, you are not required to have one. Thank you. Okay. I have only one question. Um, is there anything um, in the license, uh, licensing uh, application process that uh, considers the neighboring property owners? No. No, that's, that's, a, that's an issue that stays with you. Um, <clears throat> There's nothing, there's no conditions of state licensure that uh, impacts uh, others other than reaffirmation of dispensaries located near churches or schools. There's a certain uh, footage requirement that's already an existing law. I believe the package perpetuates it. Other than that, that all is retained with you as, as a land use function. Um, so I just wanted to clarify when you mentioned the 44,000 uh, square foot max. Uh, what, what was that exactly? That is, the, to, to get a, a cultivation, there are a variety of cultivation license um, tiers. There's one, 1A, one 1B, one two, 2A, two 2B, two blah, 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 all the way to four, if I remember correctly. Four is the large, is the, the largest, uh, it's the category for a largest. So if you get a type four license, if I remember correctly, I don't have all the licensing thing in front of me, but that is the license which permits you to grow up to 44,000 square feet. It's state license. So the state, so the state license, the largest uh, you could be um, licensed for is 44,000 square feet? Under one license. Under one license. Correct. Does not prohibit you to having number of licenses. You could have a grow in Calaveras County at 44,000. You could have a grow, at, put your license in Tuolumne County at 44,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. You could have one on one side of the county and another on the other side of the county. Depending on the local ordinance. Correct, depending on the local ordinance. And there's no max for the licenses you can have. That's <coughs> correct, in the category. Okay. But, they, but you can't be. Right, you can't do the crop right. Correct. correct. Yeah. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so uh, any public uh, want to make uh, comments or have questions? Can you get up and talk to the podium, please? Go ahead and get up to the podium. Um, I want to thank the board for the ability to speak here. Um, side note, I want to thank everything you guys have done in regards to the Butte Fire. I'm a District 2 resident. I know Chris has worked tirelessly on this. Um, had the pleasure of seeing uh, Supervisor Edson there. I think it was the day after the roads were open. And uh, I thanked him for seeing a District 1 supervisor in District 2. And he uh, made, I thought, a pretty funny joke about how he didn't see the fence when he drove up the road. And uh, I've shared that with a few people, so you got mileage on that one. Um, my question for Mr. Smith is, I understand that under 266 and 643, the state is capping the amount of these large um, tiers or class permits. Have they given any indication on how they will award that, whether it's based on population density, um, is it just the whole state level and then counties will decide how many they want to allow within their jurisdiction? Um, I, I guess my question to you is what capping are you talking about? Um, for outdoor, the largest permit was 44,000 square feet. I believe for indoor it was 22,000. Um, if I understood the bills correctly, it said that there was a finite amount that they were going to allow within the state. There was a provision in earlier versions of the package which uh, empowered the state to set a maximum amount of cultivation licenses. Okay. Uh, I believe that was removed. I will go back and look, but I do not believe that was retained in the last hours of the legislative session. Okay. Um, so the state uh, is not empowered to limit. Uh, well, excuse me, excuse me, uh, Mr. Smith, can you? 
Can you uh, come up here so that? Sure. Can we sit there? Yeah, that way you can have a microphone. Okay. And... Do you need me to repeat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please do because, yes. So, sir, what might, if I understand your question, is is does the state still have the ability to limit the number of cultivation licenses uh, at a maximum amount statewide? And the answer is, to the best of my knowledge, is that provision to do that was in the bill in previous versions of the bill. My understanding is it got removed, and that there is no state maximum amount. Um, and, re and the previous versions of the bill were, uh, were to empower the state to set a maximum. There was never a hard and fast maximum on uh, how many cultivation licenses can be out in the state at one given time. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, beyond that, I just want to say that, you know, this county is still reeling from the Butte fire. Um, it's estimated $450 million in property loss. Insurance is only covering about half of that. Um, with the 80% reduction I know on one of my parcels because the house is lost, I mean, the amount of property taxes we're going to be losing is going to be huge over the next few years. Um, I wasn't able to get any hard facts on that, but I would think it would have to be in the millions of dollars. Um, with unemployment at 7.9%, which is way above the rest of the state, um, I think it's a no-brainer that the legislative package that's been put forward is, you know, very beneficial for Calaveras County and that we can harness the potential of this industry. I think it goes without saying that it is the most valuable commodity in the county. Um, I think it trumps timber, um, vineyards, um, cattle. Again, the Agricultural Commissioner hasn't got hard facts on that, so I think it's impossible to say, but I think it's a, a well-known fact how valuable it is. Um, I commend the board on the last meeting when we were here in April. Um, you guys decided to wait for some direction from the state before we made any decisions. And I think that was very smart because here we are, it's not even been a whole year and uh, we've already got something that totally changed the whole game. Um, I think with legalization being imminent, let's start the talks now. You know, for recreational, if we already have a model in place, for medical, I think it's going to make it a lot more seamless and ultimately save the county uh, time and money. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Brad Wolfman. I just had a few questions for Mr. Smith. Um, is the definition of commercial cultivation is that one that's not a personal grow or a caregivers grow? I'm sorry, sir. Can you state your question one more time? I'm, I'm just wondering what the definition of commercial cultivation is. Is that anything that's not a personal grow or a caregiver's grow? Uh, that is a good question, and I'm looking at, um, if you look in 266, in 19300.5, you'll see a whole bunch of definitions. I'm looking at them right now. Um, generally speaking, cultivation in this package is treated as a commercial activity, meaning the, the you, you saw this notion of the licensing structure, the term commercial before it. So that, anything that, other than personal or caregiver then, right? That, well, that runs through most of the bill. So uh, it, it, I, would, I, would, I would, again, I'm not a lawyer and I would caution on this answer, but a personal grow is probably not a commercial grow. Would That's it, why it would not be subject to license. Do you think a care, again, you'd have to speculate whether a caregiver one would be a commercial as well, or? Yeah, I don't, again, as long as you stay within the limitations of a patient caregiver grow, you don't need a license, therefore, um, it's obviously not a, a commercial activity uh, as viewed under a licensing system. And you, you mentioned those limitations. You mentioned them before. They were limited to five patients. However, you didn't mention how many plants per patient. That's because there are none. It's five patients. Wow. Again, I caution, that's the state's rules. That's not necessarily what a local could do or would do. It's just a whole lot of gray area, which is what we're trying to get out of, you know. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned that you could have the, the top tier for commercial grow would be 144 thousand square feet, which is one acre. How many acres do you have to own to cultivate one acre? 
In other words, if you own one acre, could you cultivate the whole acre, or do you have to have a 20-acre parcel in order to cultivate the The issue acre? isn't how much you can cultivate. The, question, the issue is uh, how many licenses do you need? Um, and so if you want to cultivate, assuming 44,000 square feet is about an acre, if you want to cultivate two acres, you need two separate licenses. You need two separate type four licenses. Uh, at least from the state's perspective. So <coughs> there's no limitation on getting a multitude of licenses in your own category. Um, that's how you would pursue it. Again, again, the caveat and the caution is that's also dependent on what a local, what local rules are. But to get a state license, um, it's you're going to need a multitude of licenses. Okay. And, and if the Board of Supervisors, for some reason, did not allow commercial grows, does that mean that we couldn't have personal or caregiver grows? Or, in other words, would they be able to ban commercial grows and personal grows and caregiver grows still be an option? Or if they ban commercial grows, no, no cultivation could take place at all? Uh, that, uh, that the short answer is uh, yes. You, the board could, under the package as it could now, in fact, San Benito County is going through this exact very ex uh, exercise in banning commercial activity but limiting cultivation to personal groves. So that would continue under this package as well. Um, I will say that San Benito allows those personal groves under very limited circumstances and I, I suspect that if a board is going to go down that route that they would follow San Benito's suit. So the answer is yes, you can prevent commercial activity at the local level and still allow for personal grows, um, but what, the experience is, is those personal grow exemptions are very limited. What about caregiver? So Same, same dynamic. So, so can, they, can they actually say um, no, no commercial, no caregiver, only personal, or if there's personal and caregiver lumped up into one? Again, uh, I would defer ultimately to a council decision on that, but the, my, my, lay, my lay reading of the statutes and the intent of the statutes is yes, that's a power in, in, invested in the board, whether they would allow uh, a, a personal grow exemption from licensure, uh, but not allow a patient caregiver grow. Again, uh, I'll come back to the comment I made this is an area of law I would caution boards to tiptoe very lightly to minimize litigation. Uh, they may prevail, but the, the likelihood of, of still having to deal with litigation is very high in those circumstances. Thank you. And then will you be, as these things are obviously, you mentioned things are still kind of, wheels are in motion, things are changing. Will you be coming back and inform, kind of doing this with us as, as things go? Or? I, I love Calaveras County. If the board wants me to come back or members of the board or staff, I'm welcome to come back at any time. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Kaz Tomaszewski. I am the executive director of the Calaveras Cannabis Alliance, formerly known as CPR. Um, just one question um, for uh, Mr. Smith here. It, it seems as if the licensure um, is not really tied to an individual or a parcel specifically, such as if I owned a thousand acres, then I as an individual, it seems, could say procure five cultivation licenses within a category and have five separate grows on that one parcel. Is that correct? Did I understand that? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Again, subject to what locals may approve. Again, that is, yeah, I, I got to reiterate this, it's really important. That is the condition to obtain a state license. That may not necessarily be the case to obtain local license that's required. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, we at CCA believe that recent years have seen an ever widening division in the community of cannabis cultivators. On one side of this gap exists a forward-thinking, community-conscious group. Cass, can you get a little closer to the Sure. Thank you, Cass. Bend right into it. On one side of this gap exists a forward-thinking, community-conscious group of growers who have put serious effort towards conducting themselves in an ethical manner in regards to their local communities and environment. This group acquires all necessary permits for their operations, supports local businesses and labor, employs self-imposed systems for mitigating impacts on the environment, and represents an unequaled potential for income for the county via taxation. On the other side of this ethical gap resides the type of cultivation that is supported by the enduring criminal element within cannabis culture, in which growers apply very little ethics or forethought to their cultivation style, endangering their local communities and environment, 
This group steals power and water. They destroy public lands. They disregard the well-being of their neighbors in the name of personal gain and often operate hand in hand with organized crime. A few months ago, I stood before the board and I mentioned that hypothetically, if a ban were to be passed here, that cannabis still would be grown. The climate is too good, the land is too cheap, and the budget for enforcement is too small. What a ban would do, hypothetically, is hand over this market to an exclusively black market, um, the unethical side of growing. If this county is to take control of that unethical side, to suppress the bad actors that we are all tired of answering for, um, that the money, the budget for that, can only come from, we believe, accessing the revenue stream of the legal growers. Um, it has been our position for a long time that we are open for regulation and for taxation, that we believe um, that the board should put that burden on us in order to help us take responsibility for cannabis being a positive thing in this community. The question, the problem has always been approaching that monster. Um, it would have to be a large complex ordinance to handle a large complex problem. Um, how does one tell the difference between a good and bad cultivator? How does the county access that taxation? How do we make sure the intoxicating substance like marijuana doesn't find its way into the hands of the youth? Um, how can it possibly be effectively enforced? Um, the creation of this program has always been a daunting one. Um, but with the implementation of this legislative package, that may no longer be the case. Under the new laws, Calaveras will have access to a comprehensive plan which will provide a rubric for solving these problems. Under the new laws, those that are on the right side of the law will be issued a license after a background check and application process, making the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate growers clean cut. Licensees will be subject to multiple audits and inspections, ensuring their continued compliance. A plug and play framework for taxation and fines will be established which counties can choose to adopt, solving the problem of how to access the revenue stream of legal cultivation. Every aspect of a legal grower's product will be labeled, tracked, and recorded to ensure it remains in legal channels, staying out of the hands of the local youth. Um, a new Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation will be created to enforce these laws via fines. Um, for a long time, the issue of cannabis cultivation policy in Calaveras has seemed impossibly big, and the weight of it has graded on us all. Um, I know that this board is tired of thinking about how to make it work, and I know we're tired of coming in here and answering for the misdeeds of the criminal counterparts. Um, my message to the board is that I think it's, it's right to put this to bed. I think that this is the springboard we need to have the conversation. We want a new era of collaboration between the responsible growers of this communi community and the government, and we are ready for that conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any other public comments? Mr. Chairman, if, if you don't mind, if I can interject here. One of the um, <clears throat> questions from a previous person, I'll be up frank, I gave him the wrong advice. Okay. Um, if he looks at AB 243, um, he will see the variety of, of requirements for uh, a license in terms of the size. First question was, is there a limitation? And uh, for those very large grows, licenses, yes, there uh, could be a limitation by the Department of Food and Agriculture on the large grows, not necessarily on all license um, things. And then the issue of um, the issue of can you, if you own a thousand acres, can you, do you need one thousand different one acre licenses? And appear that's probably not the case. It probably is if you own a thousand acres, you probably can only cultivate under one license, one acre of that a thousand. So theoretically what you would have to do, if I read the statute correctly, is you'd need to break up your 1,000 acres into 1,000 one acre parcels and then go get a license on each uh, acre that you own uh, to get the, the, the license category. That's the way I read it. So a little bit of uh, inaccuracies in what I had reported earlier. But if you look at um, AB 243 and real quickly, um, I want to look at the, uh, the sections, and I'll give you that really quickly. 19332 uh, of AB 243, that spells out the, what the license types, the conditions of each license types as it relates to cultivation. Yes, it's a rather lengthy uh, run of, of, of reading there. All right, thank you. 
Okay. Good morning. Bill McManus, Calaveras Project and Calm. I uh, want to thank uh, Mr. Smith for his presentation. There's a lot of information. Um, you know, I, it's kind of a horror story when you listen to all of it and read the rest of it. Um, what we've done at Calm and the Calaveras Project is to go through 266, not so much to figure out what it does, but what it doesn't do. We know what it does, and it's going to put you in contact with dozens of state agencies. It's going to create one of the largest bureaucracies in the state of California. And the, uh, and the Assembly and the Senate have conveniently allowed themselves to assess fees and left the nasty business of taxes to the local ordinance or local jurisdictions. But some of the things that we worry about with 266, first of all, it's an internet-based system that theoretically will track marijuana from seed to ashtray. And we've all seen how internet, government internet systems seem to work or not work. In addition, there's no limit to doctors recommending. There's some guidelines and, and things that will be urged of the medical profession. There's no limit to the THC levels or concentrations. There's no limit to how much you can buy, assuming you buy in amounts that keep you under one half pound or 480 joints. There's no increase in age to 21 like the recent tobacco bill. There's no description of enforcement other than a fine double the license fee, and possible loss of your license. There's no limit to the number of grows. There's no information or requirement for a uh, drugged driving test to be uh, conducted in the state of California. There's no limit on hash oil production and sale. And there's no money set aside for education on the health risk and harms. Fees collected must return to the county via grant processes and approved by the legislature. The state of California has set aside $10 million out of the general fund to uh, prime the pump on this, and there's an additional $10 million available should someone in Sacramento decide it's okay. Uh, this is to get the program going. Of course, the first party to receive this money back is going to be the state of California, and especially small counties will have to go hat in hand to get reimbursed for money that you have to spend up front. You will have to have additional law enforcement. You will have to have ordinances. You will have to have some better enforcement arm developed in Calaveras County. You will have to front that money and then look for reimbursement later. Uh, the uh, pesticide regulations are not mandated. They're simply urged and that was uh, AB 243, Section 193.31, Section C. Uh, let's see, the deadline for the county ordinance, you're depending on the state to uh, tell you the truth about whether or not that's going to be rescinded or not. Otherwise, you will be under the gun. And if you don't have the proper ordinances in place, the state will step in and impose its regulations on the county for that matter. And that is uh, section 11362.777, section C, item 4. Uh, we, do, we appreciate the information on possible legal challenges and the effect of voter-sponsored initiatives. There's one other thing that's looming out there that may affect all of this, and that would be the results of the election in 2016 where the, the uh, federal government may decide to start enforcing the laws that are on the book, and then all of this is moot, and you will have spent a lot of money for nothing. Um, you know, I can go on and on about the combinations of licenses and, and state departments and fish and game, water resources, pesticide department. It, it goes on and on and on. And I can assure you that every state agency is lining up at the trough for this money to get funding for their own departments, which will be, in effect, a transfer of their expense from the general fund through a fee process to um, pay their, uh, their own departments. I uh, would also like to thank RCRC for, uh, okay, that's very quickly. Supervisor Williams uh, put out a report on the devastating effect that uh, uh, marijuana growing has had on the water supply in California. Uh, I've got a copy here if you'd like to take a look at it. I think what we all look forward to is the one surefire way to get out of this is just ban it. Get rid of everything, let the dust settle on the election and how 266 may turn out, 
If you want to revisit this in a year or two, go ahead. You, you have that option at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jed Richardson, a resident of Mountain Ranch, owner of Cave City Vineyards and a realtor at Mountain Ranch Realty. Um, Calvers County obviously is dealing with the aftermath of a devastating wildfire that has severely taxed the county's limited resources. Along with the goals of rebuilding the lives and properties of those in need, the county needs to focus on rebuilding its economic base. We all want a vibrant community of open-minded and motivated individuals who contribute to their community through their skills and labor. We want a community which does not need to go elsewhere for supplies and services. And in order to achieve that goal, uh, the county needs a strong economic base. Um, as Mr. Bolger has pointed out, uh, uh, as the largest economic driver in the county, exceeding other agriculture, winemaking, tourism, and forestry, the cannabis industry needs to do their part to support the county through taxation and fees. Uh, the recent legislation by the state of California, as Mr. Smith has pointed out, sets up the framework to achieve these goals, and Calaveras County uh, needs to take full advantage of this opportunity, not by placing further limitations on agricultural operations beyond those specified by the state, uh, but by creating an appropriate system of registration and regulation. As Mr. Tomaszewski has pointed out, the Calaveras Cannabis Alliance is eager to work with the county to create this framework, uh, just as it is working with the State Water Resources Control Board to create responsible farming practices for cannabis. I encourage the Board of Supervisors to work with CCA to achieve the goal of rebuilding the county. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Um, so, if I understand, uh, I was reading a little bit on my phone bill correctly, um, there is a provision um, in this legislative package such that um, if the agency that imposes a fine um, or, you know, basically catches someone in violation, that agency is eligible to receive the money from that fine. So if it was a county agency, the money would go to the county. Is that correct? That's my understanding. I'm not super versed in this area of, of um, the statute, we spent a little bit of time on it, but yes, that, that is uh, generally the intent. But with fine monies as a whole, it gets, kind of, it gets kind of tricky in terms of how they wind their way into various coffers. But yes, there is clearly was an intent that um, a licensing entity where there's a violation of the condition of license gets some amount of, of that, uh, that fine money. So that would possibly represent a revenue stream then for the county in launching an ordinance? Yes, I get where you're going on that. Uh, the short answer is yes, probably, although the legislature has been very, very concerned about bounty hunting um, schemes. Um, and again, I would have to go through that area very carefully to um, see if there were protections on that. Uh, we had a county council uh, Christina Robb from San Bernardino, who spent a lot of time on that, and I would have to go read that and confer with her about how ultimately it was structured. Okay. Um, uh, and another thing, I know that the WQCB, uh, the Water Ordinance, covered pesticide <coughs> regulations. They have a best uh, practices list of pesticides that are allowed to be used, not be used, and they have a, a robust ordinance for water control. But I also believe I read in the legislative package that there was a mandate that the Department of Pesticide Regulation needed to coordinate with the Department of Agriculture to develop statewide standards. Is that correct? That's correct. That is, that's correct. Okay. And again, you're, the, you're never going to, as long as, as, unless we change federal law in a variety of areas, you're never going to have a, a fully integrated pesticide use, non-use scheme, but the package attempts to get there uh, on a practical matter by uh, using these terms standards equivalent to etc and so um, that will that be perfect no um, until we change federal law but it tries to get us there as close as we can um, it's and the county may choose to adopt the state ordinance in full is that an option there is no state ordinance or sorry the, the state like the state legislation and, and adopt that as local ordinance 
a county has the ability to adopt a variety of schemes to address a licensing structure to comply with the state licensing scheme. It may not necessarily be through an ordinance, um, but, but its discretion is preserved on how it wants to handle those various questions that a board would have as it relates to land use functions. Understood, okay. And last question. Um, I, I believe if I understood McManus correctly, he might have mentioned something about uh, manufacturing of hash products not being included um, in the, the legislation. Um, but I believe there is a manufacturing licensing tier that is regulated. There is a manufacturing licensing tier, that is correct. Um, the reason I'm kind of going fuzzy on you again is there were so many different versions of this bill and there were, there were a variety of versions of bill that spoke specifically to edible manufacturing products and, and other manufactured products. And again, I can't recall exactly how that turned out. But at, at the very minimum, there is a licensing category for manufacturing. Um, and that will be overseen by the, by the Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation. So I assume a lot of those issues will be dealt there. Excellent. Thank you very much. If we could continue, I just want to help with or, or at least express my views here on the funding, which is uh, the current topic of discussion. Uh, in uh, uh, Assembly Bill 243, Section 19350, Article 13, uh, there, the funding scheme is uh, outlined. And basically what it is saying is each licensing authority, and I always get confused who the licensing authority is, whether that's city, county, state, or some other agency, shall establish a scale of application, licensing, and renewal fees based upon the cost of enforcing this chapter. So what it sounds like is uh, when you hear from one industry or another that this is somehow going to be a windfall for the county, we're going to be rolling in dough, really all you're going to be able to charge is what you can prove your expenses were. So, uh, you know, if you start charging more than what it actually costs to provide the services, I think that the lawsuits that Mr. Smith was alluding to are going to grow exponentially because you can't, it's a service. You can't, you can't charge for something you're not providing. Uh, if we continue on in uh, 19351, uh, uh, that would be section B, subparagraph 1. Uh, the penalty money can be used to repay the initial funding, and that's provided so that the state gets this money back out of whatever fee or penalties the county assesses and puts into their account in Sacramento on the internet system uh, that's supposed to come back to this county. The state has access to that money. Uh, the rest of it is going to be coming back via the grant process where you have to go to the state and apply for the money that you collected in your jurisdiction and show that you had some expense or cost that to cause that money to be in Sacramento and not in San Andreas. And that's the way I read it. I, I could be way wrong on it. But it always seems to be that the grants equal the fees minus the grant preparation expense. So when you start adding up all the money uh, that you have to spend to hopefully get some money at the end, uh, you may want to total it all out and see which way you want to go uh, because assessing a fine uh, could actually end up costing you more money than what you're collecting. Thank you. Just a quick question for Mr. Smith. Um, regarding pesticide applicator licenses, uh, I have one as a, um, a vineyard owner, and it's currently issued by the county through the Ag Commission uh, under authority of the state. Uh, are those available now to cannabis growers? Um, or can they, it, should there be a reason they shouldn't be available? The, the, a couple of things. The package does not create a pesticide applicator license. Okay. Uh, that, that does not exist under the, the package. I, I would guess I, the, the other aspect of your question, I would defer to a county ag commissioner on, on how they want to do it. Um, my understanding, again, is because, federal, because of federal law, those pesticide a application license cannot necessarily be awarded because you'd be violating federal law because there are no rules and standards applying a pesticide to a marijuana uh, grow. Mm -hmm. That does not necessarily prevent regulators from establishing standards about what, what 
should be used on those. It just doesn't necessarily convey the weight of a license. Uh, even though those licenses are issued by the State Department of Pesticide Regulation? Correct, okay. because it's still a violation of, of federal law to apply a pesticide on a marijuana product because you, you, have, no, you have no protocol for that that's been established. Okay. So uh, again, uh, again, I would defer to even more detailed questions to a county ag commissioner on that. Remember, the county ag commissioner is, is basically carrying, is the arm of the state in, in that licensing function. So there's very little discretion that the county has in this conversation. Again, the, the package was created very mindful of this dynamic, and the best way we could get to deal with it is to have some type of standards established, but not obviously go to the extent of a licensing requirement because you just can't have a pesticide license license um, to, to use on a marijuana product under federal law. At least currently. I, I do have a question if I can follow up. Um, so on the, it looks like um, there's going to be an establishment of an organic program by 2020. Um, and so uh, I'm just wondering, um, being in, that I support organic uh, farming, um, if we could just go ahead and adopt a local ordinance that says all marijuana licenses have to be organic. Uh, I don't think there's anything preventing you from doing that. Um, I'm certainly not aware of that. Um, I'll be anxious to see how the state comes up with an organic program. Um, there is required testing um, in the scheme, so maybe it's easier than what we contemplate. But um, you, just a couple quick comment on that, Supervisor, because it's tied into the Appalachian world. For those counties and jurisdictions area of the state that are a little more pro-marijuana and want to brand, that was why those provisions were put in. So organic branding as well as Appalachian branding was, um, was put in there on purpose uh, for exactly those reasons. So. Um, again, something to contemplate about how you want to handle that at the local level as well. But you don't think there's anything in there that says we couldn't just start off by having it mandated to organic? You could have an or all organic rose. Okay, thank you. Again, might be tough to enforce. Not impossible, but might be tough to enforce. Yeah. Just, just a quick comment on that. I, I'm a person who holds an organic registration. And um, it might be difficult because the county has to issue that, has to be issued through the state and through the USDA. So I would think that that would be difficult unless you just said it made some arbitrary definition of organic. What I was thinking is going off of the, you know, the existing standards. Um, you know, On what pesticides you could use, essentially, yeah. Whatever the organic standards were for what you're using now. Yeah, but and how would you enforce that? You know, does the county ag commissioner come out and ask for? Just like the, yeah. you would enforce it with the, your your existing state organic uh, um, license is how I'd see it. Sure, but it has to be throughout the whole system, and many of the things probably used by uh, cannabis growers are not registered organic. You know, even though they may be organic products. Uh, you know, the soil has to be organic. You know, the yeah. way you grow it has to be organic. You have to de define organic area. So it yeah, can become very difficult. Yeah, there's additional regulations to uh, yeah. challenges. But it seems like it might be a way to uh, get get rid of the, the pesticide question. You know, that is one of the main concerns that folks have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, if, if it has to be organic, then the, then the pesticide question uh, kind of goes away. It's, Right. So that, this is one of those things that are going to ha get hashed out. We can probably sit here and talk about it for like two hours. So sure. Yeah. Why don't we move along? Good point. That's why you're in shape. <laughs> um, Bonnie Newman from Devil Springs. Um, in 1999, I became a home care worker for an individual who um, qualified and required medical marijuana. As a care provider, I was under the impression at that time that I was given the responsibility to assist my client in um, his uh, medical needs. 
And at that time, I went to the welfare department and I asked, what is my responsibility as a care <coughs> provider? And said, oh. I asked the wrong person. I asked my social worker who told me, oh, we don't have anything to do with that. OK, I was really discouraged. Instead of going to the head of the department who had established a policy or protocol, um, I just sat back and uh, allowed my client to um, obtain his medical marijuana in whatever way he felt necessary. And then um, in about 2010, I became aware of a home care provider who had been arrested for um, providing his patient with medical marijuana. And at that time, I felt it was really important to find out what exactly a care provider is entitled to expect for their rights and responsibilities. Um, we presented a discussion at that time uh, with all of these people listed as uh, a resource to find out what our responsibilities were. And um, at that time, the district attorney indicated that IHSS worker is a primary caregiver. And primary caregivers are mentioned three times in the legislation. So although I could get no answers from a department that I was working for, I felt it was important to find out exactly what we were required to do and not do. And um, at that time, um, we found out that the medical marijuana task force that had been working since the, early, uh, the late 90s had, had certain processes and policies in place. And um, basically, if you are as a user of medical marijuana, have your doctor's permission slip uh, or authorization or whatever the term is, and your has authorized your care provider that you are exempt from uh, prosecution. But now I'm finding out a little bit like there's five ways you could be, I mean, five clients you could provide medical marijuana for. So I'm really concerned, what is the definition of the care provider? Is that the person that provides the ongoing, the medication, the the bathing, the grooming, or is it someone that's been designated as the primary caregiver for medical marijuana? Because we know primary caregivers can provide therapy, they can provide uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, medication, and so is there a specific way that we could define who the care provider is? And at that time, I was not willing to grow anything on my property. And I asked the district attorney, could I proxy my responsibility of a care provider to somebody else? And the district attorney told me, you've already been proxied the responsibility. You can't give it away. So has that changed in the past uh, <coughs> four or five years? And how would that be defined today? to protect all 300 of us. Because basically, about one in 10 home care consumers are medical marijuana users, according to my home visits that I did when I was getting signatures on a petition. So a number of our consumers are medical marijuana users. Mr. Chairman, really quickly, um, I would, um, Encourage, um, I forgot your name, I'm sorry, um, the lady to look at 19319B of SB 643. Again, that's 19319B of SB 643. That is the patient caregiver exemption language that we talked about, but it also refers to a definition of a primary caregiver associated with the uh, exemption. Uh, to which section 11362.7 of the Health and Safety Code offers uh, a definition. So again, you want to look at 19319B of SB 643, and then also look at section 11362.7, 
of the health and safety code. I am not familiar with 11362.7 or else I would give you an opinion, but um, my point is, is there are parameters around what a primary caregiver is. Mr. Chairman, can I go back to the question or the topic just before th this one uh, regarding the organic growing and all that? Because there is some language we're, in here. Yeah, I know. There's, we're pretty much done with that, actually. Well, it, the answer was, it wasn't answered, I don't it, think. It was. It, yes, we can. Okay. Go ahead. Just so it's clear, there's nothing that prevents the, the local jurisdiction to put reasonable restrictions, whether it is requiring organic, requiring a uh, ban on pesticide use. Um, there's nothing that prevents a local jurisdiction from putting reasonable re uh, regulations in place. Does that make, does that clear it up for you? No, what I was referring to. Okay, Bill, come on up to the podium. It wasn't so much the organic portion of it, but the pesticide portion of it. And when we, when you look through Senate Bill 643, they acknowledge that the federal government has no part in this because it's a Schedule One uh, product. And so it's kind of left to the state to come up with pesticide and growing things. And you start going through that they're not really bound to do this. This is in uh, 19331, Section C that cannabis growers and caregivers need to urge a state department to do something about developing guidance in the absence of federal guidance. And they go on to say that uh, cannabis cultivation sites are um, uh, uh, most typically have some sort of residue in them that needs to be regulated. But the state has not obliged itself to do that. So I don't know if the county can compel a state agency to come up with regulations that they don't have yet? That would be my question. I don't think that the county can compel the state to do anything. Um, we can certainly make recommendations and uh, make requests. And again, there's nothing that prevents the county from put, putting reasonable regulations in place as far as an ordinance for county regulating, county permitting, um, of medical marijuana would that go and the cultivation the of it. Would that go through the uh, department? It would be dependent on how the board would set it up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Dina Morris, and my question is for Mr. Smith. Is there anything in the legislation at all that addresses um, surrounding property owners of a cultivation? Again, no, not that I'm aware of. That, that, that is a, a function of this, this body, the Board of Supervisors, to make any rules or restrictions or uh, any considerations to that. Um, again, the only restriction, not, not on cultivation for sure, the only other restrictions that I'm aware of, uh, particularly with dispensaries, where there has to be a minimum amount of uh, foot uh, space uh, to have a dispensary located near a church or a school or, or something to that nature. Uh, as it relates to cultivation sites, uh, there's nothing in the state statutes which specify where those belong and who uh, can, can or cannot be impacted by that, that site. Is there anything in the legislation, I know that you talk about items that will protect our water, um, protect um, patient caregivers and the growers and Etc. Is there anything that protects our air from the odor that a cultivation creates? Um, I would have to look through that again and see the various environmental entities that are referenced. Uh, I want to say the Air Board is, but I'll have to go back and look. Again, a lot of different versions of this bill uh, over the last nine months. I'll look at that. Um, um, believe there is references, maybe not specific to the Air Board, but other environmental uh, agencies, both at the state level and elsewhere. So um, my sense is that air would be potentially um, come into this uh, as it relates to, generally speaking though, for air quality issues, those aren't necessarily nuisance 
aspects. They are more about toxins or contaminants when those entities get involved. So uh, I would caution, um, you know, just as, as it relates to nuisance, probably not. The legislature really never spoke to those aspects of marijuana cultivation. I would urge the Board of Supervisors to consider the smell that cultivation creates. It creates a smell that's worse than a dead skunk starting in August all the way through October or longer. And if you happen to be downwind of that smell, you can't have guests over. You have to explain to your children what they're smelling and the whole situation. Um, I urge you when you're thinking about passing ordinances to create an ordinance for cultivators that require neighboring property owners to sign off on the grow. Just as you have to have, to get an ABC license, you have to have surrounding businesses um, that give them the chance to say, yeah, that's fine or not. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, it is a right to farm county, and I've certainly recognized the issues of smells. And, um, but, you know, nuisances are uh, covered under the right to farm policy by the county, and properties are zoned for agriculture. Uh, neighboring properties cannot object to nuisance smells because of that. So. Okay. Another question for you, Mr. Smith. Um, <clears throat> Is there any limitations put forth in the legislature on um, what account, what type of taxes the county can levy on marijuana? No, and we specifically made sure we didn't. So your ability, the county board of supervisors in conjunction with approval of the voters uh, can set those tax rates uh, as they see fit. There's no limitation on that. And that again was very purposeful. And um, tax revenue that the county receives based on county taxes, will that be in any way um, have to be sent back to the state? Is there anything language as to that? No, uh, no. Uh, what, you, what you raise, well, let me just be caveat here. You never know what the state legislature is going to do. You never know what the voters may do in an initiative, but uh, as currently constructed, no, the, the amount of tax proceed a county would raise would be, uh, would, would be contained within the jurisdiction in which it raises. Fees may be a different story if a county must collect a certain fees um, that ultimately need to go to the state and the, there's a, a relationship and an interaction there. Um, but as it relates to taxes, no. The, account, the purpose of county taxing authority is to do a levy um, so that a county can address its own fiscal issues associated with marijuana. And quite frankly, because it would be a tax, you don't necessarily need to have the proceeds of that tax dedicated to marijuana. You could put it in your general fund and do what you want. Again, that will also depend on how you structure the tax and how you get voter approval of the tax. Hypothetically, I would like to point out to the board, if the board were to adopt for our county um, the tax that was proposed in the bill that Mr. Smith put up on um, the display earlier of $9.25 per ounce, um, quick math based on the number of cultivators and average yield in the county, if hypothetically every single one of them were to have a tax from the county of the same amount, it would equal approximately $32 million a year. Um, so any issues in regards to the cost, um, what is owed to state, I'm very confident could simply be taken care of by a thorough taxation program which accesses the majority of cultivators here. Okay. All right, I guess we'll be finished now. So um, I guess I move to uh, adjourn, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Yeah, and, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks uh, Thank you, Mr. to the public for coming Thank and attending us.